I'm, I'm believing this year we're going to see miracles unprecedented. Uh, Tim, I want you to come up. And uh, this is Tim's last Sunday before he heads off to the Philippines for a couple months. And uh, Tim, I just want you to share briefly what is taking place in the Philippines. And we're going to pray for you. Y'all can be seated. Good morning. So, I've spent maybe a couple days researching and trying to figure out how in the world I'm, I'm going, what I need to do when I arrive. Um, so, as soon as I arrive in the Philippines, this is after uh, 20 hours, it's about a 20-hour trip, because um, it's the other side of the world, um, I have to go in quarantine. Uh -huh. So, I had to purchase a hotel for an exorbitant rate to go into a quarantine for five days, and at the end of the five days, they'll come and do another COVID test. And I have, a, have to have a COVID test before I leave. And um, I went ahead against everything that was in me, and I got vaccinated. Uh, and, and if you're against vaccinations, more power to you. I am too. But I had to get vaccinated to make this trip. And so I went over and got, got the Johnson poke. But anyway, uh, um, because I got vaccinated, I don't have to quarantine quite as long as what I would normally have to do. So make the long story short, once I'm free and can go into the Philippines, um, I will uh, um, have about six weeks of, of ministry. I'll be, I'll be ministering in several, several churches. I don't know what else. Um, I'll be doing there as far as schedule wise. Um, I have somebody there that's that's working with me, but the big news is is I'm getting married. Amen. <laughs> Come on. And um, I'm very excited about that. Um, I'm marrying a, a, a pastora, and um, she's been in the ministry for many years, and um, and she's also a doctor of theology, and. Um, she was a student of my parents when they were missionaries in the Philippines um, in the 90s. And so, so we've, we've known the families for a number of years, and that's very exciting. And um, so the word of the Lord that I got, it's a, it's a little snip out of uh, Matthews 11 and 12. And the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, but the violent take it by force. And that's the word of the Lord that I got. That, uh, excuse me, 2021 was brutal, but 2022 has a promise. And the kingdom, we will take the kingdom by force. Yeah. We've been beat up enough. We've been beat up enough by this government. We've been beat up enough by this, by this COVID, which is the equivalent of the flu right now. We've been beat up enough. It's time for the church to rise and take the kingdom by force. Amen. And that's what I'm doing in the Philippines. Amen. Let's stretch our hands towards Tim. The scripture I have for you, Tim, is Joel 2. 25, and I will restore and replace for you the years that the locust has eaten, the hopping locust, the stripping locust, and the crawling locust. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you, and you shall never be put to shame again. Father, as we send him apostolically, we thank you for the anointing that breaks the oak. I thank you for the ending of a season. I thank you, Father, the last several years of hell comes to an end and you release him into a fresh season. 
I thank you that this marks a new season for you, Tim, releasing you into destiny and purpose, living out the promises that have yet to come to pass, and that you shall be you shall eat and be satisfied and never put to shame again. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, you know that song, There's a Miracle in the Works. Um, when we were in, in labor and delivery, uh, everything had been going as planned, you know. And uh, that song just kept coming to me. And I was going, okay. And so I turned it on and, and I'm worshiping with it and Anna's in bed and everything's as planned. Everything is, baby's been head down all day. Come in to do that final check, and she goes, oh, I think I feel an ear, and I knew something was wrong. And so she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the doctor on call. Our doctor had gone home for the day, which I was a little perturbed by, uh, because you have a plan, right? And so our doctor had gone home, so they send in this other doctor, and she said, I'm just going to do a quick check, and they brought in the, the ultrasound machine, and uh, this doctor was a hyper doctor. And she goes, oh my gosh, it, it's an emergency. The baby's uh, feet first, and, and we got to rush you back for an emergency C-section. And da 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 I mean, just hyper. I don't do hyper well. <laughs> and in my ears, all I can hear is what Dr. Jones had said to us in 2015, which is your wife will not survive a C-section. It will be fatal to her if she has a C-section. And here's all the reasons why. So being vulnerable and real, I went into fear mode. I was afraid because here I am, almost lost her in 2019, and now you're telling me you're going to do the one thing every doctor has always told us not to do. And so our doctor comes back. She comes back up and she says, well, you have two options. We can, uh, we can deliver a breech baby. That, that's not impossible. We can do this, but here's the risks that you're facing. Uh, if he gets stuck, we're going to have to do a C-section anyways. And the risk of him losing oxygen is, you know, this percent and, and goes through all the stuff. Well, for weeks, I had been praying because I had this, this suspicion that the enemy was going to try and give Everett a birth defect. I, I really felt that this was the attack of the enemy. And so I'm going, okay, this isn't our option. We can't deliver a breach, baby. He's going to get stuck. I knew it. I just knew he's going to get stuck and he's going to lose oxygen and we might have a vegetable as a child. And we still might have to have an emergency C-section. And at that point, it's still going to put Anna at risk and they both could die. And so I told the doctors to get out of the room. My father-in-law had been in the room, asked him to leave, and I'm talking with Anna. And the Lord reminded us, of two things. Number one, I'd had a dream years ago that Anna had been laid on a table and had been cut from hip to hip and the Lord scooped out the disease from her body. The second thing was the dream I had about Everett. His name means of brave heart, the Lord has healed. And shaking with tears running down my face, I said, the Lord prepared us for this. Of brave heart, the Lord has healed. We have to be brave. And we're going to have to go with a C-section. So my father-in-law comes back in the room and he says, I, I just need you to know, I have a lot of peace about Anna having a C-section. I have a lot of peace about it. Now, this is the man who, who in so many words would say, save my daughter over the baby. Like, do whatever you can to save because this is his pride and joy, his only daughter. And he says, have a C-section. Go, go what is more risky to Anna. And so we made the decision, we go back, C-section goes wonderfully, they get the baby out, Anna's home recovering well, obviously in some pain, obviously there's a recovery process from a C-section, but I want to thank our church for praying. As soon as I sent the text message, I could feel the strength of the prayers of the saints. So I want to talk to you this morning about owning the call of God. Because there is something that we have to do when we want to own the call of God around our lives. We've talked about for the last several months, we talked about 
being sons, not servants. We talked about identity. And we talked about what it means to walk in our identity as sons and daughters of God. And then we talked about life on mission, about the mandate, that each one of us have a mandate. And today I want to talk to you about owning the call of God and believing for the fullness of God. The word I have for 2022 is one word, excel. E-X-C-E-L, excel. This is a year that we will excel both individually and corporately, but it's going to happen because we own the call of God. Pastor Tammy Wallace, I texted her as soon as I knew it was happening. I was, and I said, I am so scared. Can we just be real? We get scared. We get nervous about things in our life. And, and this is, I, I want to read the text message because it was, it was so good. Uh, and, and I have it pulled up. This is what she texted me. She said, well, I had it pulled up, it disappeared. There it is. She said, Jesus is okay and not shaken by our humanity. I need you to hear that this morning because I think for too long, we have played faith. Can, can we be really real this morning? We have played faith. Oh, I've got faith that can move mountains. But on the inside, we're shaking and we're scared. And God is not shaken by our humanity. But here's the thing. He doesn't leave us in our humanity. He doesn't leave us. We can't live in fear. We can be afraid at times. We can go through some struggles, but we can't live there. We have to own the call of God. We have to own it with everything in us. Our humanity is real. We will face fear. We will face uncertainty. We will face doubt. We will face unbelief. But here's the reality. We are in a war. You have a real enemy And the arena is a spiritual one. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but we wrestle with all those demon spirits. But Eden was so funny. She says, you know what Joanna taught me, talking about uh, Joanna Herndon? She goes, she taught me that the devil's ugly, his feet stink, and he has no teeth. (laughs) And I said, that is such a good reminder, Eden Grace. It's such a good reminder because we are in a war. We have a real enemy, but he's ugly, his feet stink, and he has no teeth. Someone should have said amen. (laughs) We're in a war. But what does it mean to excel? It means to be exceptionally good at or proficient in an activity or subject. It means to have an excellent spirit. It says of Daniel that he had an excellent spirit. You know the book of Daniel is the only book in the Bible not written in Hebrew or Greek. It was written in Chaldean. It was written in the language of where Daniel was in captivity. And so the word that he uses there for excellent is yatier. It means to jut over, to exceed, to be exceedingly excellent. That's our word for the year. We are going to be exceedingly excellent. You know what happens to become exceedingly excellent? You have to face your current state. And that's not fun. <laughs> I was talking with Shelly about a situation this week, and I, I had to face some things. The Lord wanted me to take some responsibility for some things that I had not wanted to take responsibility for because of past failures. Now, I'm not talking about moral failure. I'm just talking about areas of our life where we weren't excellent. And those are difficult things to face. Because we don't want to face them. Because if we face them, we become accountable for them. And if we become accountable for them, then we have a responsibility to act on it. So I've had to work through this area where I was not a good steward in the past. And so the Lord wanted me to, to look at stewardship. So this is an area God's working on me in, in the area of excellence. To jut over, to... To be exceedingly excellent, not just good at. The Lord isn't looking for us just to be good at something. He wants us to walk in excellence. He wants us to walk in such a spirit that people take notice. It says Daniel was of an excellent spirit. And they noticed him. 
they noticed there was something different about him. Numbers 14, 24, which is kind of my verse for the year. Caleb was of a different spirit. That Hebrew word I talked about last week, it's the arrow that flies the farthest. Caleb was the arrow that flew the farthest. That there was something about the way that he was structured. He was aerodynamic. Kind of like Greg's Mustang. You know, it's just, it has that slipstream that just catches the wind, right? There's something different. That's what God wants us to be. So how do we get there? How do we get there? Well, we've got to believe for the fullness. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and jump down to verse 12. John chapter 1, verse 12. And I'll, I'll give the scripture slowly to you, Melanie, so you can pull them up. John 1, verse 12. John 1, verse 12. Because I want to read this together this morning. John chapter 1, verse 12 is where we're going to be. When you're there, say amen. amen. But as many as received him... To them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of a man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's jump back to that verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Here we have an important connection. Those who have received Christ become children of God. It is a becoming as we behold. What you behold, you become. Those who received him, to receive means to take in fully, to partake of. When we receive communion, we are partaking, we are taking in fully. To those who received him, he gave them the right to become. What does it mean to become? It means to be transformed from one image to another. To those who... Do we have verse 12 pulled up? Can we get it? Verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. We need to understand this. This one, this son of God, this one who came as the son of God, the child of God, the only begotten of the Father, Jesus Christ, one distinct factor concerning him, the one who was full of grace and truth, according to verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, full of the ability and the empowerment of God, full of the revelation and the truth of God. No limitation. He who came, those who received him, were given the right to become the children of God. So if he was the only begotten of the Father who was full of grace and truth, the full embodiment of the revelation and the power of God, if he was the only begotten of, of God, if he gave us the right to become the children of God, then we walk in the same likeness with no limitation. There is no limitation to those who are the children of God. John 3, 34. For he whom God has sent speaks the word of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Here's what the Amplified says. For since he whom God has sent speaks the word of God, proclaims God's own message, God does not give him his Spirit sparingly or by measure, but boundless is the gift God makes of his Spirit. How many of you are ready to be boundless this year? Boundless, without limitation. He who, but those who received him, he gave them right to become the children of God. And he gives his spirit, not sparingly or measured, but boundless is the gift God makes of his spirit. So for Jesus, his anointing and his ministry was without limitation. 
He had the fullness of the Spirit. He had the full measure to do all that his Father required. Yet for us, if we consider the realm of miracles today, some blind eyes are opening, but not all. Some deaf are hearing. Some cripples are walking, but not all. We have lived in and have ministered in a realm with limitation. But I'm believing that this year we will excel. We will go beyond limitation. We will get past the boundaries of what we have held on to as our own crutches of unbelief. Yes, our humanity is real. Pastor Tammy said it. God is not shaken by our humanity. But the second part of that text was, don't give in to it. Don't give in to it. Yes, humanity is real, but don't give in to it because that is what limits us from walking in the boundless measure that God has given to us. The example we have, the one we are so connected to by family birth, Jesus Christ, the one with no limitation and something the Lord would have us to see there is a realm in the Spirit without limitation. Where all whom we pray for receive the miracle. Where there is indeed a fullness of the Spirit. I'm going to tell you, I am pressing in in this year, no matter how dark it gets, no matter what situation comes, I'm going to press through and press past every limitation because God has called us to excel. You know, I used to get real annoyed when I'd hear preachers say things like, well, if God has brought you through, shout amen. You know why I got annoyed? It's because I hadn't come through. But when you've come through something, when you've gone through a death, when you've had to die to the plan, how many of you have ever had to die to the plan? You've had to die to what you had imagined life would look like. We go through a death, but it is in the death. Unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it can bear no fruit. Stop living by yesterday's plan and get into the realm of no limitation. Believe for the fullness. John 1.16, for of His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. What does that say? For of His fullness... We have all received and grace upon grace. Here again, of His fullness, not a part of His fullness, but of His fullness, given grace upon grace. Now listen, we've received of His fullness, but for us, it's a process. Piece by piece, grace upon grace, developing, ever growing, ever becoming more impacting. And the vision that God wants us to see, the equipping church, is that just as Christ walked in fullness, so too He would seek to have His church also walking in the fullness. 2 Corinthians 5.5 5. Now He who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. Mm. Go ahead and pull that up because I want to break it down. 2 Corinthians 5.5 5. I told a few people before service, Amber asked me, what's the title of your message? I don't know. I literally have five different messages that I was praying into. I don't like being unprepared. I studied to show myself approved. I was in scripture all week. Even in the midst of all that was going on, I'm going, God, you got to speak to me. And he kept giving me one word, Excel. The computer program? Yes, I spent lots of hours in Excel this week putting together some spreadsheets. But I'm going, God, what is the word? What do you want me to preach? Excel. Thank you. That's great. What about Excel? And here we are believing for the fullness. 2 Corinthians 5.5. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God. He who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge in terms of seeing what God wants us to achieve through our lives is the vital understanding that we have been given the spirit as a pledge that Greek word pledge is the word deposit 
in advance. We have been given an advance on the kingdom of God through the Spirit of God. You want that new card? Can't afford it? So what do you do? You have to arrange the money. Put a deposit. Put a down payment. You can't pay for it in full, so you put the down payment. So God, who has a kingdom for His people, says in advance of the coming kingdom, I'm going to give you my spirit without measure. A guarantee that is put aside for you. I have a kingdom coming. But in advance of that manifest kingdom, I'm giving you my spirit as a full down payment, as a full deposit, as a pledge that I am coming back. The down payment always anticipates the full ownership and use of a vehicle. When we received the baptism of the Spirit, it was a down payment, a guarantee of fullness, a pledge of something more, that just as Jesus walked in the fullness, so we have the promise and the guarantee of the fullness. Yet today we live in a tension. If we were to be honest, some receive sight. Some receive healing, some cripples get healed, yet the Spirit is our guarantee that it will not always be that way. Let me say that again. The Spirit is our guarantee that it will not always be that way. There is coming a day where I believe every person that I pray for will be healed. That every person you pray for will be healed. That the miracles will come easy. We won't have to contend for them. But you know what's going to happen? We've got to step out of ourselves we got to deal with our humanity. So the question is, how do we enter the fullness? How do we receive not just the down payment, but receive the fullness of the kingdom? In Exodus, as the people of God come into freedom from slavery, the promise of God was to bring them to a land flowing with milk and honey. It was the promise of fulfillment, of abundance, of no lack, complete provision and blessing And I want you to turn in your Bibles to Numbers 13. Numbers 13 and jump down to verse 21. Numbers 13, 21. As you're turning there, let me give you some context. In Numbers 13, the children of Israel finally arrive to the time to inherit the promise of God. They stand on the brink of the land promised. Here they are right at the cusp of the breakthrough. Here they are. They're standing right there. They can see it. The land flowing with milk and honey. Numbers 13, verse 21. Moses sends spies to check out the land. We talked a little bit about this last week, about Caleb, how he was of a different spirit. Numbers 13, verse 21. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin, as far as Rahab, at Labo Hamath. When they had gone up into the Negev, they came to Hebron, where, and these names, y'all, Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak were. Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eskal, and from there they cut off a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two men. Get the picture. A single cluster of grapes they had to carry on a pole between two men. That's some good grapes. With some of the pomegranates and the figs. The place was called the Valley of Eskal because of the cluster which the sons of Israel cut off from there. Verse 25. When they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days. So they spent 40 days. 40 days these spies spent walking the land of promise. Spying out the land. They went on and came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel. In the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So they reported to him and said... We came into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Now, if they'd stopped there, they would have been good. Here's what happened. Here's a word. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, 
and the cities are fortified and very large. And indeed, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites are living in the hill country. And the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Two things to notice here. Number one, the promised land was everything and more is promised. God had not lied. I'm sending you to a land of promise, a land flowing with milk and honey, with grapes and bunches so huge that they have to be carried on poles between two men. But here's the second thing. The land had enemies. So the spies come back. And they come back with the foretaste, the pledge, the deposit, the guarantee for fullness. Here are the grapes, children of Israel. Here's everything. It's it's just as they promised. It's just what God said. But we're afraid. There's big people there. Their cities are big. Their cities are fortified. Yes, the land is everything that God said it would be. But we saw some things that made us afraid. It was a great moment. You know, I, it reminds me of just like the day that I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was eight when I, when I got filled with the Holy Spirit. It didn't happen in the traditional up at the altar type of way. We had a lady in the church at the time. Her name was Sister Kay. She'd grab people's tongues and shake them and say, Loosen the name of Jesus. <laughs> Stick your, give me your tongue. That's how she'd pray. I don't pray for people like that to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Number one, COVID. Number two, that's just gross. <laughs> but she'd take your tongue and shake it so you got filled with the Holy Ghost. So I was up at the altar one night, and I saw her coming, and I'm thinking, mm-mm. <laughs> she came to me, and she said, little brother, you know, I think the Lord's going to do it like he did it with me. You're going to wake up speaking in tongues. And I thought to myself in that moment, well, if that's how he did it with you, why don't you just pray for everybody to have that? So <laughs> grabbing people's tongues. Lo and behold, the next morning, woke up, couldn't speak in English for a couple hours. Filled with the Holy Ghost. But it was, it was what was made available. I realized in that moment what was available to me. As I begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, I begin to feel the river that God promised in John 7, 38. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And it began to transform and I began to understand there was a supernatural capacity that God gives us. But here's the problem. To enter the promise, to inherit the fullness, to partake of the promised land, some enemies have to be fought and overcome. And this is where we stop short every single time is that we believe for the fullness, we believe that God can do it, and then our humanity shows up and we live in our humanity rather than stepping into the supernatural access that God has given us. There has to be some overcoming and conquering. As we read of their history, you would think that by now, 4,000 years later, that we as the church would wake up to the reality of what He's paid for and think 4,000 years later we'd we'd read their history and we'd see that God was always on their side and that it was his intention to ensure the promised land and its fullness was received there was some conquering that was required but you would think that by now they would have realized if God brought me through he'll bring me to but we often don't see our temptation often is this Sneak over into the promise, get a little bit of the fruit, and bring it back to our wilderness. Let me go get some more grapes. Let me make sure the giants don't see me. Let me make sure I stay under the radar just enough. Let me partake of just a little bit of what God has promised. Maybe a glass of milk. Maybe a tablespoon of honey. Maybe just one of those grapes. I'll just have a little bit of it. Maybe we conquer just a few things in our life and then we grow comfortable. I'm good living in the wilderness as long as I can eat of what's in the promise. And that's how we often live. Just enough. Just enough to get by. Just enough of the promise. I'm good with just speaking in tongues. I was listening last night to Dr. Iona Locke. She's gone on to be with the Lord. But oftentimes, sometimes on Saturday nights, I don't want to study my message. I just want to get fed as I'm getting ready to prepare to feed others. And so I'm listening to Dr. Iona Locke from 1996 at Dominion Camp Meeting at Rod Parsley's church. So, I mean, here we are 25 years later, and she's preaching this message that I, I almost was tempted just to let her preach this morning because it was so good. And she was talking about 
fruitless tongue talkers. We get a portion of the promise. Robo shaka rababara and no fruit. I even wrote on Facebook, your, your prayer language means nothing if there's no fruit attached to it. Israel had experienced a foretaste. Here the children of Israel see all the fruit. We've brought back some fruit, but lo and behold, there's some enemies on the other side. So we've experienced the foretaste. We've known moves of the Spirit, and we're satisfied with what we have. Oh, if I could just get Pastor Jacob to pray for me and I fall over one more time, I'm good. I just need my weekly fill-up. You know, I want to slap Christians when they say they come to church for a fill-up. You should be full and overflowing when you show up to this place. Because you should be drinking and eating every single day of the Spirit of God. Now, do we come empty sometimes? Yes, because we've been battered, beat up. Our life is sometimes difficult. Are there times I come in here empty on a Sunday morning? Yes, there are times. And I get filled up before I get up there. But let me tell you, I don't make that a repeated process. I can't feed you out of what I don't have. And you're supposed to be out there feeding others who have yet to come into the sheepfold. And you're supposed to be demonstrating what the kingdom is. You can't do it empty. So don't come here for a fill up. Come here fulled up. That's not even proper English. Fulled up. (laughs) Always envision is settling in a land flowing with milk and honey where like Jesus there's no limitation. But Israel failed to enter because they wanted to settle. They didn't want the war. Victory only tastes sweet when there's been a battle. Victory without a battle isn't victory at all. That's just maintaining. The danger is always to settle for what we have. The opposite of excelling is settling. So the temptation for us is to settle. To no longer press for more. To lose the fresh wind of the Spirit driving us to know and experience that there is more. There is a fullness we have yet to receive where there is no limitation. It was the temptation that Elisha had faced. Remember in 2 Kings the opportunity for him was double anointing. Or a limited anointing. His first taste was while plowing when Elijah throws a mantle on him. And as the time got closer for him to enter the fullness, three times he was tested if he would just settle for a touch. Elijah had thrown the mantle on him early on in his, in his life. But as the time is coming near for Elijah to depart, Elisha was tempted three times. Settle here in Jericho. Settle here in Bethel. Settle here in this place. Just settle. The prophets at Bethel. Elijah himself had said, I don't know if you can handle the fight. Why don't you just stay behind? I threw it on you. You can have a touch. All offering an end to his suffering, the fighting, the struggle of faith. You have an anointing? Go enjoy it now. The temptation was huge. No more having to deal with grumpy Elijah. No more eating bad food, living in bad accommodation, able to settle down. Everything was against him. For entering the fullness. And everyone else had settled. I remember there's been times in my own walk. With friends in ministry. Jacob, I think you're getting a little too radical there. I think you're pressing in for a little too much. You you shouldn't talk about those things. It makes people uncomfortable. Just prophesy over people. Don't, Don't share encounters anymore. It's too much. The temptation to settle, to fit in. You're too fanatical. You know, you just talk about Jesus too much. I've had Christians say that. Why not just become like the rest of us? I remember one time, this was when I was traveling a lot, I had a pastor friend say to me, you know, If you wouldn't talk about this particular subject, you'd get a whole lot more invitations. I had an invitation to do a TV show, and they said, we just don't want you to talk about this aspect. And I said, that's what my whole ministry is about. If I don't talk about prophetic purity and talk about what it means to walk in holiness, that's not a popular message. 
It never has been. Because holiness makes us deal with the areas that we're not excelling in. Makes us deal with it. Makes us contend for more. It makes us face the enemies. But the urge of the Spirit is always Hebrews 6.1. Let us press on. Go into fullness. Never just settle for the foretaste. Realize we have a limited anointing, but offered for us is grace upon grace until we enter into the fullness. And my heart is the great vision of Joel 2.23. So rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God, for He has given you the early rain for your vindication, and He has poured down for you the rain, the early rain, and the latter rain as before. It was this passage that Peter on the day of Pentecost referred to as the last days. And the promise refers to the farming year. Early rain fell just after seed time to create the right conditions for the seed to germinate. Jesus was that seed. I could break that down for you. John 12, 24. The early rain was the Pentecostal rain that fell right after Calvary. It was the foretaste. But the latter rain fell just prior to harvest to swell to fullness the ripened grain and so enable the harvest. And Joel is prophesying here that both the early rain and the latter rain will fall in the last days. That there will be a double anointing. There will be a fullness of the Spirit. There is a land flowing with milk and honey. And I want to prophesy to you this morning, yes, it requires work. Yes, it requires conquering. Yes, it requires overcoming. But the promise is this, Joel 2, 24 and 25, the threshing floors will be full of grain and the vats will overflow with new wine and oil. Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust and the gnawing locust my great army which I sent among you there is an end time revival coming but we will only possess it if we press on I want to be a participator, not just an observer of all that the Lord intends to do in the coming days. As I close this morning, Revelation 21, 7. He who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. I want to tell you that this year is about excelling. It's about being the arrow that flies the farthest. It's about saying, I'm not going to be held back by my past. I'm not going to be held back by my present. And I'm going to let the powerful pull of the future, the anchor of hope in my future that is ahead of me, draw me into what God has given me. If the children of Israel would have just seen the promise over the problems. As I close, if I can get that music on this morning. If they could have seen the promise over their problems, they wouldn't have just had to carry the the, the vines. They could have lived amongst the vines. Forty years earlier. But because there were some problems, there were some giants, there were some strongholds that they were going to have to overcome. They couldn't see the promise past their problems. If you want the fullness, you got to believe for the fullness, but you got to understand there's some work. There's some work. You've got to face up. We don't like to look in the mirror because we see all of the things that we perceive as problems. You got to change your perception this morning, church. Stop looking at your problems through your eyes. There's there's an old story, and and I am closing. A woman had been looking in the mirror for years, and every time she looked in the mirror, all she could see was her crooked nose. And she missed the fact that she had cancer growing on her shoulder. For years, all... She'd go to the doctor and he'd say, I want to take a look at your shoulder. No, the problem is my nose. I need you to fix my nose. I'm not a a plastic surgeon. But you've got an issue. I, I can see this growth here. She finally went to a cosmetic surgeon, had her nose fixed, and died a day later of stage four cancer. 
Because we often look at what we perceive our problems to be. Ignoring what's growing on the inside of us. God wants to deal not with the superficial problems. He wants to deal with the things that keep us from the fullness. This is the year to excel. I don't, I don't have some rhyming, timing, prophetic word for 2022. I'm not going to join the bastion of prophetic words all over the internet. Because the word of God is enough. And this is what the word of God is. Let us press on. Let us excel. Let us get the fullness. Let's not just believe for it anymore. I'm so tired of believing for revival. So tired of believing for miracles. I want to walk in them. How do we do it? Face up to the issues. Deal with the junk. Let God clean us out. And let's do it. Will you stand this morning? Spirit of the living God, how we love you. Oh, we love your presence. We love your presence. God, there are people who are watching by live stream today who need miracles. There are people in this room this morning who need miracles. Jesus. Karen Lauser needs a miracle. Buddy Stapper needs a miracle. Yolanda needs a miracle. There's so many in this room this morning that need miracles. And God, you are able. But God, I'm ready to move on from just believing. Let's press on. Let's overcome. Father, release the anointing right now. I just release a corporate impartation right now of an overcoming spirit. To overcome I pray right now that the Holy Ghost and fire would come upon this church right now. Those in this room and watching by live stream, purge us, clean us out, and let us press on. Let the anointing that breaks every yoke fall on your people right now that we might overcome and possess the promise. In Jesus' name. Those who have never made a decision to follow Christ this morning. I feel like I know everybody in this room, but you might be watching on live stream this morning. You might be in this room. Pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I repent of my sin and I choose to follow you. I choose to leave behind my past and walk in the power of the new creation. In Jesus' name. Amen.